Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Parekh. Um, on, uh, I'm, I'm a co-founder and CEO of uh, Disruption Credit, and it's been a, 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 our great honor at uh, Disruption Credit to partner with Peter and, uh, and Dara uh, to put this thing together. Uh, I want to add my welcome to, uh, to Jason's and uh, um, uh, also, I want to just say, you know, when we started to think about this conference, uh, uh, feels like a long time ago, uh, we never imagined it would be at this capacity uh, in terms of interest and so on. We thought we might actually have way too much room when we committed to the space. So I, I want to, uh, I know a number of you had, you had, had some difficulties in terms of logistics and registration. I want to apologize. Uh, we did try to do best, but our team members are around to uh, address any issues you may have. So thank you again for your patience, and thank you for coming. Um, uh, the next uh, 40, 45 minutes, we're going to start to talk about uh, uh, the student loan segment, which is one segment that Jason out outlined in his, uh, in his presentation. And it's, a, it's an area that we're very excited about. Um, just uh, by way of teeny bit background myself, I. Uh, the only other, the only place I've ever worked in my life is Goldman Sachs, uh, so please don't hold that against me. I was there from 82 till 2003. I, uh, in the early 90s, I founded the internet research uh, practice at Goldman, uh, and we had the good fortune to work with uh, hundreds of uh, uh, leading companies that were disrupting so many segments of the internet. And that story is continuing, even though we obviously had an internet winter, you know, in the, in the 2000s, and it's coming back strong, and we're seeing a whole crop of companies obviously doing very exciting things. The financial uh, segment has been, uh, has been a holy grail. Back uh, in, the, in the 90s, it was, uh, it was something that we always knew would, would uh, see st meaning, start to see meaningful disruption. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of the crystal ball, I had the time. Uh, I felt because of a lot of the incumbents' advantages and so on, it would take a, it would take a long time, at least a decade or more. And, uh, and it's been a teeny bit longer. But it's been great to see uh, all the entrepreneurs and, um, and companies that have been uh, attacking this, uh, this space. Uh, in my former uh, role um, uh, and, and, and as an investor uh, in, in this space, uh, I've long passed the 10,000 hours of pattern recognition of uh, looking at new companies and, and our founders and entrepreneurs. And uh, you know, um, you know, when you meet, uh, meet a, a founder, CEO, uh, who's a little bit more special and just stands out, uh, I would say, uh, you know, when I when I met you, Mike, it was uh, it was definitely that moment. Uh, the way you talked about the opportunity, and uh, and uh, and what you would you all have accomplished so far in trying to do, because uh, it's still very early days, uh, was very very impressive. And and so immediately, I you know I, I asked you, and I, you said thank you. You said yes, so thank you to do a little chat before we start the student loan panel to talk about some of the issues. Uh, so let me let me come over here. If I I don't know if the mic still works, should work. Um, so maybe we can recreate a little bit of that conversation we had uh, in terms of, um, I mean, you're, 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 you've, um, you've obviously had an illustrious career at Wall Street uh, in terms of hedge funds and banks. Uh, you, you had a whole host of opportunities when you started to look at, look at uh, doing this. Can you just walk through, <laughs> tell the story again, if you would, sure. how you picked this one versus the other categories and, and uh, um, how it all got started. Sure, and I, m my mom always thought I was special too, so I appreciate it. <laughs> well, we are in agreement. Although she thought I was special in a different way, but <laughs> proved her wrong so far. Um, so I, I'll give you my background really quick and, and talk about the genesis of SoFi. Um, and, and so it actually wasn't Wall Street. I started my career at Wells, uh, Wells Fargo in 94. Um, when I was there, I ran a group called Financial Products, which was structured product development, derivative trading, and proprietary trading for the bank. Uh, I did that till early 2000. I left to do my first startup, which was a software company that I grew, got profitable, and sold to Broadridge. Um, in 2005, I left to start a hedge fund called Cabazon, uh, which is based out of San Francisco, works for a couple of very large family offices, runs about a billion dollars of capital. And in 2008, when the world was falling apart, one of those families came to me and said, you know, the financial system breaks every 25 years. Uh, you're a smart guy. I'd try to think about a better model. And uh, I knew Chris Larson pretty well, who was uh, a founder and at the time CEO of Prosper. And I reached out to Chris to talk about what he was doing in the peer-to-peer -peer lending space. And I really liked the idea of disintermediating the banks. I, I didn't necessarily uh, capture the whole model at the time. And so um, thought about that a lot. Uh, a couple more years went by. And in 2010, a good friend of mine asked me if I wanted to go down to Stanford and do a fellowship at the Graduate School of Business for a year there. And I've been staring at a Bloomberg screen for a really long time. Uh, every time it blinked, I could feel myself getting a little less, a little less intelligent. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't come back. So for all those of you staring at Bloomberg screens, I warn you. 
Uh, and so I went down to Stanford, and serendipitously I met some of the co-founders of SoFi who were talking about this idea of intersecting social and finance, and the idea of social being something that's local, interactive, transparent. And to me, that seemed like a, a really interesting backdrop for a financial services play. And so we were looking for a vertical to demonstrate that and looked at ideas in banking, brokerage, insurance, but ultimately decided to focus on student loans. And the motivation there was threefold in that one, um, it's a trillion dollar industry, uh, it's totally broken, there's no underwriting, it's 93% direct government lending, it, it's sort of a classic market failure. Um, two, 65% of the students at the Stanford Graduate School of Business borrow, including some of my co-founders, so we had people that were using the product. But three, and most importantly, it was a really elegant application of social, the premise that you should be able to get pools of alumni who care about the school, care about students, they invest in a fund, the fund lends to students, and you create this explicit social contract, which is if I default, you see it. And the premise behind that is you're borrowing a page from microfinance that people don't like to default in their own community. So you can address issues of adverse selection and moral hazard when you create that kind of bond. But at the same time, you're creating a lender who's engaged not just because of economics, but because of affinity. And to us, uh, it seemed like a really interesting opportunity. Where, the oppor where, where things really unleashed for us was uh, Stanford Financial Aid Office had told us, look, we haven't had a domestic student, a domestic graduate school business student default in 15 years. And they're primarily paying these 7.9% uh, grad plus loan rates. And so we looked at that and said, all right, where's Sally Mae doing securitization? What's the average cost of funding loans out there? And, and figured at the time, this is in a higher rate environment, that it was probably about 5% funding cost. And so it, it presented one of those rare Pareto situations as an op entrepreneur that you can actually benefit both sides and, and still build a business. So we were able to lower loan rates, raise returns, have enough in the middle to, to build SoFi out. And the obvious question that begged out of that is, if it was obvious to us, where were the banks? Why didn't Wells Fargo go in and lend at Stanford at six and a half and, and lay those loans off at five? Uh, so I went back to Wells, and, and uh, you know I left on very good terms when I left there. So I spoke to some senior folks, and you know they told me the challenges they have is as a depository institution, it's very difficult to lend at Stanford at six, and then go across the street and lend at San Jose State at eight, um, for all kinds of reasons, and not the least of which is a public relations reason, and, and the fact that you'll get dragged out to Washington, and Maxine Waters will yell at you for a while if you do that. So, um, so, so it explained why the banks weren't there. So what had happened in student lending is in 2010, the government took the loan program over and they created a loan rate that artificially segments the market out. And so you've got about 20 billion a year of production that if you look at it on a very naive cohort default rate basis, uh, those folks are overpaying for their loans. And you have about 80 billion of production, annual production, where those folks are underpaying. And the challenge the banks have is they can't go in and focus just on the folks that are overpaying. And so they've left. So Citi's out, Chase is out, Wells Fargo only does certain kinds of you know, more parent plus type lending. So we, we felt we knew why there was an opportunity and why there was a market there. And what we wanted to do was test the thesis at Stanford. So we created a $2 million fund. We called it the Cardinal Fund. This was in the fall of 2011. Uh, I went out to 40 alum, raised $50,000 a piece from each of them. The reason I didn't have my hedge fund put $2 million in is I wanted to test the social thesis. I wanted to test the, the thesis of engagement. And we lent $20,000 out to 100 students. And what we were able to do is we validated economics. So at the time, we did a six and a quarter loan rate and a 5% unlevered coupon. But we were also able to validate the social thesis. So despite the fact that there was an alumni directory and all kinds of infrastructure within the school, people did want to get engaged. And they got engaged in a very meaningful way. And to us, it gave us enough encouragement to actually build a business out of this. So last year, we did three really important things to grow SoFi. The first is we set up some infrastructure. So we have an entity called SoFi Lending Corps. It's a 38-state lending entity uh, through state registration. Uh, we're slowly expanding that out. I think we actually might be up to 42 states at this point. So we have our own lending licenses. We do it at the state level. We don't rent a charter from a bank and, and buy the loans back. Um, we uh, originate warehouse loans, and then we sell them down either to underlying school funds or to securitization. And we have a broker dealer called SoFi Securities that's responsible for raising capital for those underlying school funds and is also participating in placing debt for the securitizations that we do. Uh, the second thing is uh, I was very, very fortunate to get some great human capital in the business. So uh, Rob Lavitt used to be general counsel at Sally May, came over as our general counsel, runs our lending policy. Um, Nino Fanlo used to be CEO of KKR Financial um, and was treasurer at Wells, came over as our CFO. 
uh, and Adam Boyden, who was president of Conduit, uh, came over as our COO. And uh, I, I don't know how I got all those guys. I don't have Polaroids, but, but somehow I got them all in one spot. Um, and on the back of that, we were able to do the, the third thing, which is we went out and raised $80 million of equity capital last year. So a, as an entrepreneur, I, I would never want to raise $80 million of equity capital. It's very expensive money. But the, the challenge that we had being in a new space was um, we needed capital to fund assets, but the market wanted to see the assets to give us capital. And so you're in a, ch a classic chicken and egg conundrum there. And um, it was easy for me to go to Stanford and get alumni to participate. It was a much different value proposition for me to go to Harvard or MIT or Michigan and say, trust me, give me money. I'll originate really good loans. Um, at the same time, the street uh, was interested in what we were doing. Um, but actually, one of my street counterparties is in the audience sent me an email that I sent last summer where the guy said, uh, I'm not sure there's anything here, but it's an interesting idea. That was the general view last year on the street. The, you know, People were looking at it, but they just weren't sure we could pull it off. And so uh, we did that $80 million raise, we had another 20 million of alumni capital, and we funded $100 million of loans last year. And the, the key on what we did was most of our lending was to actual folks who had graduated. So we, we refinanced people. We weren't lending to people in school. And that refinancing changes the dynamic of the credit in a pretty significant way because we can go in, we can document income, we can document free cash flow, we can underwrite by FICO minimum scores, although FICO is not a good underwriting mechanism, but we can talk about it later. But we also do it in a way that we buy the loan from the servicer, so there's no direct-to-consumer lending, so you avoid the fraud issues that come from that. And we also do it in a way that we believe it's a private education loan, which means it's generally non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. So unlike traditional consumer credit, you have a much higher collection rate to the extent that you need to collect. Um, and uh, so, so it, the key on that and the challenge on that was when you're going out and you're trying to get people who have already graduated, you no longer have the school as a, as a focal point to source that credit. And you're trying to go out and reach folks who are dispersed primarily through major metropolitan areas, so San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, Boston, Chicago. And, and the, the value proposition needs to be very compelling. So if you're an MBA, for example, you graduate, you got $85,000 in debt, which is our average debt balance for our borrowers. Um, if I go to and, and I'm going to save you 100 basis points on your loan, you know, that might work out to 30, 40 bucks of free cash flow a month. So are you going to spend all weekend filling out a SoFi application, taking pictures of your ID, getting your credit checked to, for that kind of free cash flow savings? So you're probably not. So we needed something that was more compelling, and that's where community came in. And we really pushed this idea of SoFi delivering value beyond a loan, delivering value of, of community and community connection. So for example, we've had four borrowers who have lost their jobs uh, since they became SoFi borrowers. We've gone into the community, we've gotten two of them employed and two more that are getting employed through the community. Um, we've had two people start businesses where they, we gave them economic forbearance for six months while they built their business plans out and, and they've both gotten funding. Uh, we've connected hundreds of people for mentorship, resources, other types of connections. We've got 80 events between now and the end of the year where folks can come in. And you know, We just had one in, in Silicon Valley where we had 10 borrowers meet the guy who runs Google Glass. And he talked about what was happening in, in innovation on that side. We've got one in New York, um, I think, uh, early next week. So we were able to tangibly build value around that community. And, and what that did is, it turned our borrowers into evangelists. So if you know anything about net promoter scores, net promoter scores are how referenceable you are to uh, how your customers refer you to other, other folks. I think the highest net promoter score out there is 72, it's Trader Joe's. Um, we have a 60, and I don't think there's a bank over 10. And, and it just illustrates that we have a very evangelical borrower base. And what they do is they go through their social channels, through Facebook, through LinkedIn, through Twitter. They talk about SoFi, and that's become the primary source for loan origination for us. People come through referral via social network, and it's created an extremely low-cost customer acquisition model. So we pay south of $200 to get a borrower for an $85,000 loan balance that's worth over $4,000 to us. Uh, so it's, it's created a very attractive margin structure, but in a way that we're still delivering value to both sides. The, the challenge that we had until very recently was, by design, we raised that capital, we lent it out, and then we figured that some combination of seizing the portfolio and the market and just being in business, we'd start to unlock capital. And, and it started to happen at the school fund level. So um, we're at a point where uh, right now we have six school funds that are actually closed because of excess along capital. 
uh, where people began to see the value proposition, the dollars began to flow in. But what we did to really open that up was a couple things. One, um, we got a warehouse facility from Morgan Stanley, $60 million, got a $40 million facility from Bancor, uh, so that's $100 million of warehouse capacity. We have term sheets for about $200 million more, which we'll probably take down. We have bank partnerships at the underlying school fund level where the banks co-invest as a silent investor, Perry Pursuit of the alumni. Uh, so we have a deal with CPB for $30 million and, and uh, with PacWest, I think, for the total being up to 100 And we probably have $200 million of bank participation deals in the pipeline. But what really opened it up was the whole aspect of securitization. So we didn't think we could get securitization done for two to three years because we thought we needed the operating history. And uh, thanks to the tireless work of, uh, of some folks over at Barclays, uh, we've started to unlock that. And it looks like we're going to be able to do a securitization uh, late summer, early fall. Uh, we'll probably come out with 200 to $250 million uh, and with a senior facility that will get rated most likely single A. Um, and it creates a very attractive low double digit type return to the equity investors, which will primarily be alumni who are swapping out of the school funds into that equity interest. But also we have institutional partners that are, that are taking interest there as well. So it's created a, a, a different dynamic than our business. The pendulum constantly swings back and forth. So one day you're capital constrained, one day you're asset constrained. Um, I wouldn't say we're asset constrained right now. We're originating uh, you know, probably 2 to $3 million a day coming through organically without major marketing campaigns happening yet. So you can think of 60 to $90 million a month of deal flow that's coming through for us. Um, we'd like to get that up to 5 to $6 million a day relatively soon, so over the next two to three months. And that will require some marketing and some other efforts. We're keeping the school list relatively closed. So we have 77 schools right now. We'll probably increase that to 100 and then stop. And that's important because for the value of community, you need some level of exclusivity there. And what's really interesting is, is two things that have developed out of this. One, uh, we're in the process of doing some corporate par uh, partnerships. So there's some big firms in the Valley that we have great relationships with that represent hundreds of million, millions of dollars of student loans uh, that we plan and, and actually are in term sheets with now to partner for distribution. And then our borrowers are coming back to us and asking for more. Uh, because they like the experience, they like the company, they're coming back and saying, look, I just paid off my loan, can you do a mortgage product for me? Or can you do a car loan for me? Uh, we have investors asking us for super jumbo mortgages because it's still difficult to do that. Everybody's asking us for asset allocation. So the original premise behind SoFi was we wanted to build a transformational financial services business. And the idea was that student lending was a very interesting way to get a beachhead into that model because you have an extremely attractive customer demographic if you pick your assets the right way. It's extremely profitable, but if you deliver a good experience, you have a great opportunity to expand that footprint out and deliver a more diversified and broader financial solution. And we, we intend to do that. Um, we've developed enough capital relationships at this point that we're extremely well positioned from a capital standpoint. Uh, we won't have to raise 80 million of equity financing to do the next two or three products uh, that'll come from debt financing from other partners that we have. Uh, but over the next three to six months, we'll probably launch two more credit products outside of student lending as we continue to build in and, and try to dominate the market that we're participating in today. Mike, just uh, uh, we'll, we're going to continue this discussion in the panel, but I just uh, that was very helpful to kind of walk through the past and the present. You only asked me for the genesis, I give you the whole thing. No, that's great. <laughs> that saves, saves, me, saves me time, and it's a lower friction process here. So, But I, I did want to touch on, uh, we, we've spent the morning uh, on the consumer credit side where people have talked about, all the, all, most of the companies have been talking about being an ex exchange, a marketplace. Uh, you've obviously evolved into a vertical, more vertical uh, enclosed model. Uh, I, I, would, I don't want to say enclosed, but a vertical model. Uh, uh, can you kind of walk walk through uh, is, is how that came to evolve, and, and, and how do you do you see do you see as you're going to these these other categories uh, that, that that there's there's more of a platform opportunity as well? Sure, sure. So I think I think consumer lending in general, um, the the reason why there's opportunities for us, and and you know quite frankly, and, and others might disagree with me on this, but the reason there's an opportunity here right now is we're at this extremely rare intersection of a very, very low rate environment and banks basically being ham hamstrung from, uh, from uh, uh, regulatory issues that they're not able to go out and be as aggressive as they could in, the, in a certain market segments. 
we think that will change over time. And so to build defensibility when the banks can come back in, because you know the reality is Wells Fargo has more deposits than it has loans right now. Their cost of funds is zero. They pay nothing for those deposits. So you can lure yourself into a false sense of complacency thinking, I'm going to beat them on efficiency or I'm going to beat them on other aspects. You need a differentiation. And, and, and to us, that differentiation is community. And so the reason we built in a vertical fashion is, and I, I got this from my friends at Facebook early on when we started the business, I said, you, you can, the, the best thing to do to build social is do it on top of an underlying affinity. The best affinities are in the university system and you can basically hijack it for free. And so we built a vertical around school funds. So there's a Michigan fund, a North Carolina fund, a Harvard fund, and that community builds connection and it drives the whole thesis and brings to mind the idea of social finance, uh, of disintermediating the banks, and I think gives you defensibility that folks like that model, they want to continue to stay in it, and it gives you the ability to expand out of that model as well. So it's much more integrated and personalized than a marketplace where you know I can fund your loan and I don't know who you are. Um, that's a tough model because if you don't have that affinity or connection, uh, your defensibility really declines when rates rise and when regulatory burdens start backing off of the traditional incumbents. Let me ask you one more question and then we'll break for the panel and continue this discussion. Uh, and that's on, so you touched on the macro uh, issue. By the way, for those of you who don't know, Mike has a great blog on, at SoFi. Uh, and uh, I want to just, you know, given Bernanke's words yesterday in the markets and so on, you talked about a perfect storm uh, and, and perfect environment. Uh, how, do you, how do you, not just for your, your segment and these additional segments, how, can you give us a you know, view of uh, yeah, I mean, the world changes here, I, economic, I, micro point of view? Sure, sure. And, and, and I also uh, founded and ran a very successful macro hedge fund. So, yeah. I, so, but that I, was I, Wall Street to me, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> but, but whether I know what I'm talking about or not, um, I think we all have to be prepared for a higher rate environment. And, and I think that um, you know, the 10 years backing up from 177 to 240 is not a significant backup in the grand scheme of things. It might feel, it's very painful if, if, if your credit funds, some of, our, some of our institutional partners we have uh, have heavy credit exposure, and yesterday was a sad day for them as they got the triple whammy of higher rates, wider spreads, and, and duration extension. Um, but I think in general, we have to be prepared for it, but I actually see it taking much longer um, than folks anticipate. I, I think uh, you know we're going to go through a second quarter GDP number. It's going to be very soft. It's going to reintroduce the idea of when the Fed should exit. Um, the Fed hasn't begun to taper yet. What, what's interesting to the folks here is if you look at the securitization market as a proxy for the shadow banking system, it's still only running about 15% of what was running in 2007. So you haven't had the creation of a shadow banking system that's offset that decline in securitization. So the idea that the Fed could actually withdraw and stop absorbing that amount of supply to the market, there isn't someone else to take that supply behind them. And so I think it's going to be a much more protracted exit than, than what folks are talking about. I think what's happening right now are, are trial balloons. Okay. Why don't we uh, break at this point? Where to, please stay in your seats. We're going to just bring on the panelists quickly and, uh, and continue our discussion. Thanks. Stay right there. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So we'll continue our discussion. Uh, we thought it would be interesting, again, to continue uh, the discussion with uh, some additional participants. Um, uh, you heard uh, Mike's uh, story on, on how SoFi got started. We have a couple of other companies that are attacking the this, uh, this space from, um, again, unique vantage points. Uh, uh, we have Antonio um, uh, de Sorrento from PAVE who um, uh, comes uh, to this industry by way of uh, Sally May. is uh, a general counsel for the company, and um, uh, it's one of the first few people who I've talked about on the legal side who talks about the industry with as much passion as, uh, as, as the CEO. So, uh, so I think we'll have a fun, fun conversation. Uh, we also have David Klein, founder and CEO of uh, Common Bond. Um, uh, David's got uh, experience uh, from, um, in the industry with American Express, uh, ran a, a quarter billion dollar annual, annual portfolio. Um, and uh, again, uh, he, with him and his co-founders, they, they also have a unique approach to the, to the business. And then last but not least, we have uh, Lekit Lokesh uh, from Barclays. Uh, you heard Mike talk about uh, Tyler's work uh, at, at Barclays and, and, and uh, uh, talking to Lekit, it uh, became clear he's been, uh, he, he's been the uh, the champion uh, in terms of the space uh, within the Barclays institution, so we thought it would be useful to get his perspective on, um, on, the, on the industry as well. 
Um, so with that, let me uh, have um, uh, maybe Tony, you can start talk talking about a little bit about just introduce uh, uh, the, the Pave, and, and then uh, same thing with David, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue from there. So uh, Pave.com is a recently launched startup. We connect people directly um, and fund them for productive things. So it's not a consumption lending. Um, we connect these people directly, the backer and a prospect, as we call them, and in exchange for up, upfront money and mentorship, a prospect returns back a percent of their income to backers. So there's an alignment of interest and a, a risk sharing that's unique or distinct from what you'd have between a lender and a borrower. It has unique regulatory needs, um, which is why this is being handled by startups. But it's, it's a model that's um, attractive to lots of people, and, it, and it's, it's uh, better than debt for lots of people. And we see uh, precedent for it in the federal income based repayment program, and also with things like partnerships in, uh, or joint ventures between companies. But at PAVE, we fund people, uh, not projects or companies, um, again, in a unique human to human way. So I, I would say, at a peer to peer lending conference, we are truly human to human natural person to natural person at PAVE. Um, and, and this came about, I mean, it's an idea that's been around a long time, discussed many times, um, or discussed, tr attempted many times by the companies. Uh, the PAVE's founders um, met working together in London, had a personal experience where somebody wanted to borrow money. And uh, my CEO, Sal LaHood, said, I don't want to be your lender. I I'll be your partner. I'll invest in you. And uh, they had a successful outcome. It made them think, this should be something that it's made available to more people, and uh, that's why we exist at Pave. Right. Okay. Uh, David Klein, co-founder, CEO of Common Bond. We are a student loan crowdfunding platform. Uh, we launched our first program in November 2012 uh, at an institution that uh, where I met my my co-founders, uh, Wharton Business School. Uh, launched a two and a half million dollar program there. This year, uh, we're looking to launch. Um, and in fact, have started building presence in a number of different schools to disperse as much as $100 million. Um, we believe, I think Mike did a, a great job setting the stage for the kind of opportunity that exists uh, with respect to not just student loans, but all different sorts of credit. Um, I think he laid out well why student loans make sense to go to first. Now, it just so happens for me and my co-founders, uh, it was a personal pain point. We came to this because we felt the pain of student loans. The, the high cost, high fixed cost is unnecessary, particularly for credit worthy borrowers. And we thought, well, there are other people who, who, who experience the same problem. So we decided to do something about it. And so that's what we decided to do. I think, and maybe the conversation gets here, but I think the, the really interesting conversation, in addition to, you know, there are these equity models that are starting to develop, like PAVE. There are these debt models that are starting to develop, um, like Common Bond, like SoFi. In addition to the equity debt conversation, I think there's a conversation around community. Um, and again, Mike had mentioned it. The point is not who's going to build community. Everybody's going to build community. We're all building community. I think the key is going to be, and really the jury's still out just because the industry is so nascent, who's going to build the community that people want to belong to? Because at the end of the day, particularly for a two-sided market, in our case, we have lenders on the investment side, we have borrowers uh, on, on, on the borrowing side. Both sides of the market want to find a value. They want to be part of a community that provides value. For the investors, it's that optimal risk return dynamic. For the borrowers, it's what is that community that's going to actually help me succeed, not just minimize my personal expense line and save me, call it twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars on my loan, but my personal top line as well. Who can I connect with? Who can help facilitate my professional success? And that's something that we're very focused on at Common Bond because that's where we think true differentiation happens in this space that is emerging uh, and new. Well, I think the, the three of the four panelists have talked a lot, of, uh, touched on in the community. Uh, you know what I, what I would say the return on emotional capital or affinity capital. Uh, like it from your point of view, when you started to champion this space uh, in the context of Barclays, could you talk a little bit about how you looked at it from uh, your dollars and cents point of view and how you look at the opportunity from Barclays? Yeah, I mean, um, I'd like to touch on something that uh, Debbie Klein said early on. This is a $1 trillion market. 
Uh, it is growing to be one of the federal government's biggest issues. Every weekend before uh, Eugene and I, who's on, my, who's on my team, would launch a Sally May deal, a New York Times article would come out about some student with debt. So it's a large, large environment. There are going to be a number of players playing in it now and in the future. Um, that's why we're excited about it, I think, uh, going forward, in particular, the peer-to-peer -peer space. But I think one thing that we have to think about the student loan market is when you're looking at it, um, so I started covering the space in 06, and I had a vibrant client list of, of 30, 30 companies that you could cover, and um, the federal government came into place and quickly took away each, you know, 10, 15 of those guys, and then it was, like, down to five. So I was thinking, well, the federal government can't provide all the opportunity in the space, all the funding in the space. There has to be someone else. So I mean, obviously, Common Bond um, and, and SoFi are there. But I think of it almost like a, a, a food situation, right? So you come to a nice restaurant, you get the appetizer, right? And you get the entree. That's kind of, uh, kind of SoFi and Common Bond. And then you get the dessert, which is paid. But before that, it's the appetizer. And the problem with student loans right now and what I've covered for a long time is the fact that a lot of kids are coming to school, they're getting their student loan, but then they're charging everything on their credit card, and they're racking up a large number of uh, a large a large amount of debt at a high interest rate. So there's other startups too that uh, that are not here, but are, are definitely very vibrant in New York, also in, in uh, out west, and they're called Campus Slice and they're called Instagram, and they should provide those smaller loans. Um, but definitely, um, Common Bond, SoFi, Pave, um, Sally Mae, and even Discover will be a large part of this discussion. Uh, so that's why I wanted to cover this space, is I feel like it's dynamic. I feel like uh, we can use a lot of our human capital, which we have a ton of, and less of kind of a sluggish lending capital, which we eventually might, we'll get to. But uh, I think that's where we felt like we could add the most value to this space. Just continuing, the, you talked about the government. Uh, I mean, in this sector, more than any, any of the others, is obviously massive. There's also huge political uh, imperatives and priorities as, as well. Um, uh, and each one of you have kind of found your own path through through this. Uh, uh, maybe we should. I'd love to get, get additional thoughts around around that. What keeps each of you awake in terms of that aspect of the of the pictures over the next next two to three years? Sure. I, I think there's there's two big exogenous risks you have in student lending. The, the, the first premise is the reason the opportunity exists is because the government has a set of fixed rates that for a certain borrower segment uh, is too high. And the issue is that as rates back up and they go higher, the, the margin or the differential between where market and where those government rates are compresses. And so the question is, at what point, when, at what point do, do those things intersect? And so we always have a macroeconomic risk that's, that's overarching. Uh, but we also have an exogenous policy risk. So a lot of the policy decisions that are being kicked around right now, modifications to student lending programs, uh, would be very restrictive to our businesses because they would substantially lower the rates to the point where our margins wouldn't be there. And so um, the, the one mitigating factor you have on this is the way that the government accounts for student loans is they take the loan coupon and they discount it at the match maturity treasury rate. And so when they do $100 of loans, of grad plus loans for example, it looks like they're making $50 of profit and they book that as revenue into the budget line, even though there's no cash. So if you were investing in the government, you would short them because they show tons of revenue with no cash flow. But the challenge that they have is that amount goes into the budget as a budget line item. So to the extent that it's modified or it's reduced, they have to make up for that through either reduction in spending or increases in taxes. So there are reasons to believe that if rates back up, the government would be in a position where they'd have to actually force that rate higher or, or conversely, policy decisions that are being announced now that would substantially lower the rate would force other action, whether it be taxes or expenditure cuts, uh, that would have to occur to keep that, that balance. So there, there's some mitigation to the government factor. Um, there isn't a lot of mitigation to the overall macro risk other than the government having to move the rates and rates rise. Just, just one thing to, to add on top of that. In addition to the fact I mean, well, Mike, what you're talking about is why that likely won't happen, right, um, as, as to what the federal government has to do in order to make it happen. I think there's also the possibility of well, what, what happens if, if it does happen, right, um, just for political factors that we, we can't control. Um, and to answer that question, if you look at the bills in Congress right now, and there are about six of them flying around, they really fall into two buckets. One uh, is a group that I don't think anyone takes seriously what I would call constituency bills, ones that lower the rate so much to make a political point. And then the other bills in Congress are what I would call more serious policy bills. Um, and those bills will, in fact, lower 
uh, the, the student loan rates as to what they are right now. But if you run, and, and we've modeled each of these bills through a number of different scenarios relative to, to our rates, um, not only are we still slightly competitive with the rates, but I think it actually goes back to this important point of differentiation, which is community. Right? I think the way we think about not just student loans, but lending in general, is going through monumental change in a way we won't fully understand for another five to 10 years. And a large part of that has to do with community and the benefits that come along with community. You know, as, in, as investors, we think about, well, what is my return? And up to this point, we've really only thought about it in terms of um, traditional sense of risk return. Well, we can still think about it in terms of risk return. Uh, but going forward, when you have added elements of community and what that means in terms of how you can attract even higher credit quality borrowers onto your platform, that means something. That means that you can continue to give disproportionately high rates of return for the underlying risk, which, by the way, on our platform, for example, is pristine. Right? So there are a number of different things that we can do, even if the exogenous factors, the macro factors, don't go our way, uh, in a way that also, you know, forgive me for using the word revolutionize, but revolutionizes finance. <laughs> the, actually, following on with what David said, you know, Pave, we're very much uh, in touch with policymakers and, and following everything that's going on at Capitol Hill. It's, it's really hard to compete with the government on price when they can subsidize treasury rate, not account for cost of equity. We don't do that. Um, so I, I guess, when, at Pave, when we look at potential policy outcomes, we think um, it, it's not great. More subsidies isn't always the answer, but. Paved use of proceeds aren't restricted to education finance, and so we don't have to just uh, originate or connect people for um, subsidized products or, or, or subsidized pro, uh, uses of proceeds. Um, so you can't get a student loan for everything. Um, additionally, there's competing on quality, and so we are definitely competing on quality. Um, the nature of a human connection in that pave, you know the person's name who is funding you. Um, it's just not present in, in any dumb money environment whether it's the government or a bank. Just uh, before we open up for questions, I just want to follow up. Uh, I uh, wish we had more time, actually. This is a fascinating topic. apologize. But the, uh, uh, can you all just talk a little bit about trends in, in uh, origination, cost of origination access? Uh, it's, 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 uh, for each of these categories, you know, uh, what are the trend lines you're seeing in terms of um, origination side in terms of vis-a-vis -vis your industry, and then the other aspect uh, is uh, to touch on delinquency. I, Mike, I know you, you, you're very proud of your record there, but just uh, not just what it is right now, but how you kind of see that uh, unfolding as you look at uh, these additional JSON markets as well. Yeah, th I think within the context of origination, you have two very different dynamics within student lending. So you have in-school uh, loans, which that's a relatively low low cost point because you have a borrower base that's concentrated. You can go through the financial aid office as an alternative as a private loan solution into that borrower segment. Um, the challenge you have is it's a very different borrower than someone who's already graduated, who's employed, who has income. Um, that's a, a, a very different dynamic in terms of going after that that customer. And you know, to Dave's point, the the whole aspect of community and one of the big values behind it is not only does it massively improve the credit quality, we think it, it does address issues of adverse selection and moral hazard that I talked about earlier, but it also significantly lowers the cost of borrower acquisition uh, because people want to be engaged, they want to get value from that community. I think. Our own thinking of community is more pretty significantly that originally we thought, well, the community would be connecting alumni to borrowers. And borrowers are actually alumni as well because they're all graduates, so it's an alum to alum connection. And what we found is that a lot, it, it, because we're limited, because the Jobs Act is still hung up at the SEC, we're limited to accredited investors. And going out to an accredited investor and saying, look, invest $500,000 in the Harvard Fund, they look at it first and foremost right now is economics. And there's, there's a feel-good factor to it, but it's an economic component for them. Whereas the borrowers love that level of engagement. And so we've actually been fostering much more community interaction amongst the alum borrowers, where there's a lot of reason to be supportive and be helpful. And so, for example, when we got some folks jobs recently, it came through that borrower network. It didn't come from alumni who were stepping up to do it. Anyone else want to talk about uh, cost or delinquencies? But I can speak to delinquency a little bit. We have an income-based product, and so there's going to be people who fully perform that aren't actually delinquent, but that don't repay everything that they got. And uh, that's, at PAVE at least, we're able, unlike a debt product, we can capture some upside from people who overperform. So I, we're, our hope is that there's some balance to that. Um, 
but we are so young, honestly, and on cost too, we're so Actually, young and so manual I got that uh, there's not great data. Okay. So on our platform, for example, you know, zero delinquencies, everything's current pay. Um, you know, I think Mike triggers an interesting point, and that is, you know, who can put money onto the platform? And the fact that we're pretty much all limited, we're all limited by the regulation right now, right? And that's why we're going after accredited investors. Yep. And so the question is, what is what does the world look like, or what do we have to do now for the world that we're all going towards, particularly in peer-to-peer -peer lending space? Yeah. Right. I, uh, I think we have time for every, all these gentlemen are going to be available in the breakout room right after this, so uh, for additional questions. But let's take one or two questions. There are quick ones from the audience. Anybody? Bueller. Go ahead, Michelle. Okay, great question. So, so let me just uh, rephrase okay. this question for me. Just demographics uh, of these. So maybe everyone can kind of touch on that. That'd be, that'd be great. Sure. Well, at PAVE, uh, we don't have a legal age limit other than that you be of legal age. Um, what we think it's the best use case for are people who understand what they want to be or what they want to do and know how much money they need. So it's not a great use case for an 18 year old. It's not a mainstream product yet. So it's not perfect for an 18 year old who doesn't know what, how much money they'll need for college or for whatever career they're going to be or exactly what career they're going to be. And, and because there's not a mainstream consciousness of a general awareness of, of how these work versus how loans work, um, it's probably not the best uh, financial instrument for somebody to do first. So the best people for us are people who, who do know what they want to do, have done other things, financial products, whether it's a student loan or an auto loan or a credit card in their lives, and um, who know how much money they need. So uh, that leads us into the mid-20s. I mean, if you think about people out of undergrad, people in grad school, people finishing grad school, great use case. And they can still benefit a lot from the mentorship or um, the example that our backers can give. Our, our profile account of bonds about 28, 29 years old. Uh, average FICO's north of 750. They're making on average about $120,000 a year. Yeah, that's very similar to our average borrower. And, uh, and we have close to 2,000 now. Um, if you believe cohort default rates, uh, we should have eight to 12 of those folks in 90 day plus delinquency. We've never had anyone in 90 or 60 or 30. Everything's current pay. Okay, why don't we stop here? Uh, again, they'll be available in the breakout room. Big hand for our panelists.